He just sat there looking at me and he lifted up his hand and above his hand, I saw the world and it wasn't a model of the world. It was, I knew as I saw it that it was the actual world. It was only after I started to gather all of these attributes of the person that I was looking at that I made the connection and realized who he was. And I realized I was looking at Jesus. And I realized that Jesus was looking at me and there was disappointment and there was disappointment in his eyes. There was sadness in his eyes. Before I share this testimony, I want to preface it by saying that God is so patient and so merciful and he's so long suffering. Isaiah talks about the nature of God and the nature of the Messiah that was prophesied. And he says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out until justice goes forth in fullness. Anyone who knows my testimony knows that I've experienced firsthand how gracious and patient God can be and is with our process and with our being human. When God comes to anybody in judgment, it's only after he's already come to them with patience and grace and mercy about a thing multiple times. It's only after he's extended the invitation to repent. He even says in the Bible today, I place before you life and death, choose life. So it's so important to understand anytime a message is coming from God about judgment or that some kind of verdict has been made, the only way to contextualize that rightly is to understand that by the time we've gotten there, God has already offered mercy time and time again. So when I had this terrifying vision of Jesus, it's literally one of two times that I've ever experienced God in a way that's utterly terrifying. And rightfully so, because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. People try to make God out to be human. And although he became human in the person of Jesus Christ, to try to fully understand him in our limited human perspective is foolishness. We give authority to a natural judge in the earth, and that judge has the authority to end a person's life. How much more does God reserve the right to execute judgment with his absolutely perfect perspective, with an absolutely perfect nature? There's literally no shadow of turning in God. He is light. And the Bible says that he is love. So when God goes to judge, there's no room for fault in God in his judgment. And the Bible makes it clear time and time again that he delights in showing mercy. It says he's slow to wrath. So when I had this visitation from God and I saw just a hair of what it is like to test God's patience, it was one of the most, if not the absolute most terrifying experience I have ever had. And if as an individual, or as a society, as the Bible has already made it plain at the end of the age, when God says he's done, that he's tried, and now there's nothing left to do but execute judgment, not only is he perfect and right to do so, but it is the most horrible thing that could ever possibly happen. And I would say mostly because it shouldn't have happened because I guarantee there were lots of opportunities for people to make the right choice. So this is what I experienced. Years and years back, I had begun my walk with God. I had already learned how real he was. I'd learned to go to the Bible, to feed on the word of God, and I learned to connect with God through the Holy Spirit. He had given me a new identity. I was already born again. I was already walking as a son of God. But I spent a lot of time vacillating in my lifestyle because of deep-rooted issues like insecurity and this tenacious hunger for affirmation, mostly desiring that from a romantic relationship, but really any way that I could get affirmation. And there were just areas of my mind that still needed to be renewed that even though God had had his hand on it, I really fought with God about letting him be the all in all for that need. So the sense of rejection that I would inevitably experience when I would break up with a girlfriend or in other situations would drive me towards addictions. And I would just be stuck in this cycle of depression and addiction 
Then God would meet me and I would come back to him and I begin again, he would wash me. And this happened so many times I can't even count. He was so patient with me. Lots of people tried to help me and I received a lot of help and I'd go a few steps forward and go lots of steps back. This kind of thing went on for probably 10 years or more. So by this point, when this encounter happened, I'd been around that merry-go-round so many times and God had restored me. Even when I really lost confidence, even in him, there would be another way that he would show up and have mercy on me. I was so much like Hosea's wife. I would just sell myself back into bondage and he would redeem me again and I would sell myself back into bondage. And I had a really hard time holding on to the value that he was affirming to me that he'd given me. And it was just straight unbelief at times. By this point, I should have well been done with certain lifestyle choices. The Bible literally tells us not to make provision for the flesh. And yet that's exactly what I did. Got together with some buddies that were still into the party scene and I made space for my flesh to do what it wanted to do. So I violated my conscience. I did what I shouldn't have done. And that evening when I tried to go to sleep, I had a visitation from the Lord. Honestly, when he first showed up, I didn't even know who it was. What happened was my conscience was burning. I was in torment in the darkness. I saw a man step out of the shadows and stand right in front of me, looking me dead in the eyes. His hairline was deep and his features were very pronounced. And as I looked at him, I knew that this man, I knew that he was the smartest, most intelligent and wise person that ever existed. I knew that he had authority like no one had ever had authority before. As I looked at him, I knew that I was looking at the most powerful man that had ever existed. And yet he was so gentle and he wasn't assuming. It was almost like you had just entered into a courtroom and the judge just looks like anybody else that you might have seen on the street. But you knew what his position and his role was. You knew that he couldn't be fooled. This guy doesn't seem proud or arrogant or anything like that. In fact, he seems very humble. And yet, you know that he has complete control over your life. It was only after I started to gather all of these attributes of the person that I was looking at that I made the connection and realized who he was. And I realized I was looking at Jesus. And I realized that Jesus was looking at me and there was disappointment and there was disappointment in his eyes. There was sadness in his eyes. He just sat there looking at me and he lifted up his hand and above his hand, I saw the world and it wasn't a model of the world. It was, I knew as I saw it that it was the actual world. It was so three-dimensional and it was spinning slowly over his hand, but he never looked at it. He kept looking at me and without saying any words with his mouth, I could hear what he was thinking as the world turned to dust and it blew away before a speck of the dust could hit his hand. And I saw these tiny little souls, tiny, tiny little souls, just a few fall into his hand and he started to close his hand around them and he said, I'm taking what's mine and this will all be over. I was so terrified in that moment because I knew that he was saying, I'm not playing any more games with you. You know better by now. You know that this world is dust and that the only reason it exists is for the harvest of souls that I'm gonna take out of it. Do you know it was love for God to say those things to me? It was love for him to show me that. It was love for him to make me feel grieved for a moment so that I could snap out of it and realize that I could not play with that fire anymore. You see, there's grace for us when we're authentically struggling with something. There's grace and patience when we stumble because of ignorance but there comes a time when we do know better. There comes a time when we've seen too much. And when we've crossed a certain threshold of maturity or healing or revelation, because revelation in God is healing, there's certain things that we can't afford to entertain any longer. God is going to judge the world. 
He has extended himself to you through the person of Jesus Christ. Today, if you still have breath to breathe, then you are still walking in the grace and mercy of God. There will come a time when either you go to him or he's coming to us. In the corruptible, we'll put on incorruptible. Mortality will be swallowed up by immortality. And all of us will go from having these seed form bodies to having the glorious bodies or immortal bodies, just like Jesus has right now already. Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. He's lowly in spirit, he's humble, but he is the judge of all the living and the dead. And rightfully so. There's no one more full of humility and justice and rightness than Jesus, who literally came and laid down all of his glory so that he could save and serve the lost. And the very people who said the most ignorant things about him, and the very people who tortured and killed him. Jesus is worthy to be crowned the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he's worthy to be placed in the position of authority to judge all the living and the dead. You're never going to look at Jesus at the end of your life and say you weren't being fair. You aren't being fair. When you look at Jesus, you know that any good thing that you get from God is only because he had mercy, not because he owed anything to you. The whole human race, we call ourselves good people, but we're not good people. We hate each other, we backbite, we take things personally and then we seek revenge. We use each other to get ahead in life. We devalue each other, we exploit each other. Not to mention the actual atrocities, the actual raping, murdering, killing, destroying that we do to each other. But none of us aren't part of that in some way. No one is gonna stand before Jesus and be able to say that they were innocent. We all need the perfect, spotless Son of God and His taking our place and suffering the judgment that we should have experienced so that we can be washed in His forgiveness and we can stand justified before God and then we live a life of humility and worship of the one true King, and we do good because we love him, not because we're trying to get into heaven, because there is no such thing as a good person in this world. And I know a lot of people might have struggled like I did, like, God, what about the children? What about the mentally crippled? What about the physically crippled? What about the aborted? What about the miscarried? The Bible illustrates so clearly, and Jesus articulates so clearly, the truly disadvantaged will be in the kingdom of heaven with him. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But you have to understand, God is not going to judge someone without having offered them time and time again the opportunity to make a better choice. Today I place before you life and death. Choose life. You can try to make an excuse and say that if God was real, if God was good, these things wouldn't have happened to those people. But God says, I've got those people. Those people who have been overlooked and oppressed and have had no justice in this life or had their life completely robbed from them before they could even live it. He said, theirs is the kingdom of God. It's the rest of us who have been given so much. We're the ones who are in danger. The proud, the arrogant, the lofty, the selfishly ambitious, those of us who justify ourselves by our own wicked and perverted standards, we're the ones that are in danger. God doesn't want to judge anybody. It says he desires that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but he will have to at some point. So today, choose life, choose Jesus, put your trust in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit and he will lead you for the rest of your life until you see him face to face.